based um, can be good morning, good afternoon, um, or good evening. <laughs> Uh, I am very pleased to uh, chair this uh, uh, panel today. This is the first of two panels um, on the topic of heritage and repatriation. Um, this is a uh, part of the SOAS Festival of Ideas, as you know. Um, the Festival of Ideas um, is a, a week-long um, uh, series of virtual events with the um, broad team of decolonizing knowledge. Uh, from this team, um, we have devised um, uh, many different um, events and um, therefore the uh, panel today on heritage and repatriation uh, will reflect on this big team of decolonizing knowledge. Um, the issue of repatriation and restitution, uh, it's a very important topic um, in terms of, as I said, in terms of decolonizing knowledge. And in recent years, it's become um, more and more prominent. Um, especially with regards to the call to repatriate artifacts acquired in the colonial era uh, to the places um, of origins. Um, as you might have heard of, uh, of different cases um, um, that um, has also to, um, attention to the media. Uh, for instance, um, some of the artifacts from the British Museums or um, uh, some of the um, artifacts uh, in Africa, in specific the Benin, um, artifacts um, and so on. Uh, um, we, we have, uh, I mean, our panel today um, is a panel of experts that um, specialize in this area of uh, uh, heritage and repatriation uh, from an anthropologist, um, art historian, and um, uh, perspectives. Um, and um, in an hour, uh, uh, the expert will explore uh, some of the seated debates and then um, with obviously specific re reference to their own research, um, as I said, in art, archaeology, anthropology, uh, and try to understand um, from specific context how um, this issue is dealt with and what are the constraints and the hurdles to, um, to discuss this, this big idea of returning um, returning objects um, to where they were taken from during the colonial time. Uh, as I said, this is the first panel uh, of two, so uh, please do um, tune in again on Friday, the 23rd at the same time, 11 a.m. Uh, our uh, technical team uh, will uh, put in the chat um, information about the next, um, the next panel on this topic. Um, ah, just briefly, I, um, I just wanted to say like a big, big thank you to the organizers of the festival, uh, in particular um, the creative director, Dr. Amina Yakin, uh, and uh, the, um, the festival coordinator, Stephanie Girand, um, as well as Kumi Olutanji, um, that have been um, uh, providing us uh, with the um, virtual events. Um, I'm not going to take too much time now. I would like basically the, the format will be that I will introduce um, one speaker at a time. Um, uh, some of the speakers are still in the process of joining us. Uh, therefore, um, I will now start to introduce the first speaker. Uh, that's Do uh, Dr. Maria Costoglu. Uh, sorry if I'm mispronouncing surnames. Um, sometimes uh, um, as you know, is uh, yeah. Please apologies about that, and do correct me. Um, so our first speaker uh, on this panel is Dr. Maria Custogra, as I said, uh, who is now who is a lecturer at SOAS University of London uh, in the Department of Art and Archaeology. Uh, Maria has um, uh, received a PhD in archaeology from the University of Glasgow, and she's an expert in ancient metalwork. Before coming to SOAS um, about two years ago, uh, before then she was a lecturer curator at the University of Manchester and the Manchester Museum, where she taught and researched material culture and museum studies, and also serves in various uh, committees related to acquisition of artifacts. Uh, therefore, it will be very interesting to hear from Maria because on, um, on top of having a, a academic uh, knowledge, she also has a practitioner's knowledge of really understanding what are the issues uh, in museums 
who are at the forefront of this idea of heritage and repatriations uh, because they are the custodians of most of the artifacts. So it would be very interesting to hear from Maria uh, and from her experience um, as um, at the museum in, um, in Manchester. Um, also, uh, Maria, just to say, she's currently lecturing in curating museology uh, at SOAS. And uh, in, at SOAS as well, we have a very interesting MA program uh, in museums, heritage, and material culture studies. Uh, therefore, um, she will draw also on that um, teaching. And uh, also, she has kindly um, asked her students to join this panel and to take this panel as part of the learning um, experience um, as they are taking their courses at SOAS. Uh, and therefore welcome all the students and um, again remind you that this is the first of two panels uh, so please do follow us again in the second part um, to conclude about maria uh, just to say that she's a very passionate advocate of research-led collection-based learning that bridges the divide between academia and the public uh, in order to promote social justice um, so again I think that's really interesting how, you know, academia is important in terms of understanding the deep complex issues, but then he has to be put into practice. Therefore, the collaborations between academic and practitioner is, is extremely important. Um, in one of her recent projects in London, she designed and led master student project with the National Maritime Museum, introducing decolonial narratives to the interpretation and archiving of the collections. Uh, I leave it like this and I will I now pass on to Maria. Just uh, uh, one more housekeeping um, um, point. Please um, do put your questions in the Q&A section of the, of the Zoom at the bottom of the screen. Uh, do feel free to put in your question at any time and then I will pick them up at the end when we reconvene with all the panelists for the discussion. Uh, so please do put in your question as, you, as, as we're going along. Uh, okay, I will now uh, leave it to Maria. Uh, to uh, present, uh, um, to give us a presentation. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Angelica, and uh, thank you for having me in this panel. Uh, good morning, everybody. I'm uh, very thrilled, and I'm looking uh, forward to the to the discussions today. As Angelica said, uh, museum, uh, and, and I'm sure this will feature in many of the presentations from uh, from uh, colleagues today. Uh, museum collections have been, in, in the West especially, have been entangled with uh, colonial histories and uh, uh, it would be true to say that this is probably the case for museums around the world. Um, calls for repatriation have be, uh, of uh, objects, of artifacts, um, uh, are not new in the sector. They date back to the late 70s, early 80s, and uh, they happened within the context of post-colonial debates, uh, institutional critique uh, by academics and artists who have uh, questioned and problematized the authority of museums to, to hold and interpret um, objects that belong to cultures of other people and uh, also they were a result if you like of more involvement of visitors uh, with collections uh, more diverse groups of visitors entering the museums in the west especially in the 80s later in the 90s and a stronger involvement of diaspora communities within the museum sector so, uh, as I said, uh, we shouldn't be dealing with repatriation, reinstitution uh, of cultural property as a new phenomenon. However, these voices have been really multiplied and became louder over the past years in the context of decolonization um, and social justice debates. And um, uh, as it happens with the development of museums, since they are part and so much entangled in the socioeconomics and cultural changes in society, uh, museums kind of uh, try to respond to these new demands. And um, I think to, to experience, and a lot of curators and other museum studies experts would agree, museums are not always very fast. Uh, or very effective in their response. 
to changes in society. Uh, so uh, what we currently see is that the sector is uh, split and there is a great tension, uh, so much so that the, um, the members of the International Committee of Museums, the so-called ECOM, cannot decide on the new definition of the museum. What is a museum? What is the role of museum in society in the 21st century? Every few, every few decades, ECOM suggests a new definition that really tries to clarify and to clarify and advocate the role of museums in society. And they have been debating these new definitions definition for almost a year now, and the sector is really split into two with one hand members who believe that it is about time to advocate the role of museums in promoting justice, in uh, diminishing inequalities, in being inclusive and so on and so forth. And the more conservative part of the sector uh, who pushes back, uh, members uh, pushing back and believing that museums are here only to look after objects, to kind of simplify a very long and very heated debate. Um, so, um, one thing is certain, however, that visitors um, very much in the UK, where these uh, visitor responses and feedback are monitored very, very closely, and now we have very good record of what the visitors actually uh, think and expect and how they engage with our objects. Visitors are very clear in their feedback, and um, and they they and they see museums. They see museums uh, that keep. Um, contested antiquities or contested objects as, um, as um, agents uh, justifying the inequalities and the wrongdoings of the past. So they are very vocal and very negative and very critical uh, about uh, this issue. And um, Museums, as I said, had to respond to visitor feedback and had to respond to critiques. And there are a few um, museums that have been more successful than others in repatriating some objects. At the Manchester Museum, we had a few, some of the very early um, repatriation cases back in the in, in 2005 and, and, and so on. Uh, however, you don't hear uh, about about this as often in the news. Um, I will come to the point towards the end of my uh, brief introduction, which really aims to highlight some of the main issues the sector is dealing with. So um, we now have a set of uh, museological, if you like, tools and practices and good practice uh, methods to address uh, some of these issues and do uh, our, uh, our job as curators in a more transparent and inclusive way. And museums have tried these practices for a number of years. And these practices uh, range from inviting uh, members of communities, source communities, as we, we call them, or members of the diaspora to co-curate or co-interpret collections and objects that originate from these uh, same communities. We do see increasingly appointments of uh, curators and other staff members in museums um, from these same communities um, to break out, to, to increase the diversity in the workforce of the museum, if you like. Um, we also see efforts to revisit the archives and, um, and decolonize the language used in the archives, which is full of colonial biases. And um, of course, we see museums inviting more research into their objects and collections and be willing to open up these collections to, to the public and, to, and to, to students, to anyone who would be interested in, in uh, engaging with these collections. And a lot of uh, investment actually is uh, going through the development of um, open storage or, um, or uh, rooms and uh, facilities 
that are uh, appropriate for both uh, the preservation and the care of objects, but also uh, for inviting and welcoming uh, people working with these objects and collections. So there, are, there, there is a very big range of, of, um, of engagement in, try, in, in the effort to decolonize, uh, to decolonize or be more uh, inclusive, if you like, with the way they, uh, they use these objects. And, and bear in mind that not all objects in collections are contested, although these are the ones we are talking about today. And in many cases, these are not single small portable objects. They are full facades uh, and friezes from ancient monuments. So um, uh, defining uh, the meaning of object also is part of this uh, broader, broader discussion. Um, in, um, in an effort to uh, participate in, uh, in this ongoing uh, debate, I have initiated um, and run the past two years um, a very interesting uh, project, rather multiple small scale projects with the curators of the National Maritime Museum in Greenwich in London. Um, I, had, I had previous experience from other collections in the Northwest, in museums in Manchester, Liverpool, and, and Scotland, Glasgow, etc. However, um, coming to London and uh, thinking about working with a museum that was built to glorify the British Empire, like the National Maritime Museum is quite another challenge. And uh, we were very, very fortunate to have very open-minded and very, um, very um, interesting curators who really uh, don't have a, a lot of resources, but they have plenty of good ideas in how to, to do things differently within the contemporary context and, with, and, and, and trying to bring these ideas into their collection. So we built up some projects for our SOAS master students and um, the students could conduct original research. They were given access to everything the museum uh, had about these objects and they tried to uh, um, to, 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 to find, to fill the gaps in the history of these objects, to research their provenance, and also come up with new narratives, post-colonial narratives, decolonial narratives, and, and, and bring some of these very interesting ideas and debates the students are exposed within uh, their modules and, and seminars at source and see how they can, they can um, research and, and bring this more into the interpretation of this quite problematic collections. And then the museum actually gave us the platform to present the results of these projects. And we had a series of different outlets to do so. Some of our students were uh, given um, access to community learning programs so they could work with uh, people from the communities or um, visitors of the museum. Uh, in other cases, the reports brought up um, interesting information that changed the dating of some Chinese maps because, uh, of course, we had Chinese students who uh, could translate more accurately and they could also uh, research Chinese archives and bring this information into the archive. Um, we had a narrative developed by a student, which is now, this narrative is now used in the guided tours of the Atlantic Gallery and so on and so forth. So the students really uh, brought brilliant research skills into the project and the museum appreciated this and, and, um, and, and, and uh, put this new information in uh, good use, uh, if you like. Um, however, one area where where uh, our students constantly uh, hit the wall and they couldn't really um, find uh, what we were expecting or what we needed for the objects, for the history of these objects, was the provenance of the objects. And it is the case in many museums archives that you might have a very sketchy line um, about the donation of this object back in 1825. And 
you might have the name of the person which could be spelled in uh, every entry differently so you need to be very creative and do some genealogical research in order to find if all these different spellings actually represent the same donor and so on and so forth so there are some very big real issues in the way these objects were collected, in the way these objects were archived and they were accepted because 200 years ago museums did not really have very proper rigorous acquisition panels or even the, the policies uh, to, uh, to apply. So there are a lot of problems in provenancing objects. Uh, nevertheless, this is not the case with some of the very iconic repatriation cases we will see today. And, um, and in, the following, in the following presentations, you will have more details on, this, uh, on these ones. And of course, being Greek, I couldn't, uh, I couldn't avoid mentioning the Parthenon marbles. And uh, uh, which actually I think uh, uh, Romina might uh, correct me, but I think it's one of the oldest repatriation claims uh, still ongoing for something like uh, 40 years now. Um, and there is no clear progress on this. Uh, we have the Rosetta Stone. Egypt has asked to repatriate the Rosetta Stone at the British Museum. The Benin Bronzes, which is a huge group of objects with a very clear history uh, um, uh, uh, related to the looting of these objects. And of course, we have Benin Bronzes in France, in Germany, and other countries. And um, so the iconic repatriation cases present us with very clear ethical and uh, legal um, uh, complexities. And uh, as uh, I hope we will discover today, there is no, it's not an easy thing to have a blanket policy to deal with all the cases together. We, ha we have conventions and we have guidelines, etc. However, one of the reasons that uh, we don't see these repatriation cases moving forward is that every museum operates under a different set of policies and statutes and the official guide by UNESCO or other bodies, it, uh, is, uh, only it only presents a set of recommendations. It does not have any legal enforcement uh, power to push institutions to do this or, uh, that, or that. And uh, before I conclude, I would like also to mention that uh, when we are discussing repatriation, we shouldn't be excluding uh, all the objects that are currently in um, circulation from uh, conflict zones. Think about Iraq, Syria, Yemen, um, and, uh, and of course, these objects have to be uh, protected and when found have to be returned to, the, to, 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 to these countries. Um, there is uh, the, pro the cultural property, although it was not called uh, such back in uh, 49, it is protected by the fourth uh, Geneva Convention. Uh, so immediately after the end of the World War uh, II, uh, everybody realized the need to protect heritage. And, and this is explicitly stated in the Geneva Convention in 1949. And uh, this convention prohibits military uh, forces to, um, to, to damage, uh, to damage uh, enemy property. Actually, when it comes to cultural property, it comes to cultural property, it obliges them to protect it. Of course, we had these cases of army, the army involved in the looting of Iraq, Iraqi antiquities, etc. And the media are full of, um, of, that, of such stories. The details of what is protected under the cultural property law um, can be found in the 1970 UNESCO Convention. And, uh, and I think um, uh, the legalities are very complex, and that's why countries prefer to discuss these claims in a bilateral or international committees instead of involving lawyers, etc., uh, because the issues are uh, mainly ethical and moral and uh, and um, 
there is still a question about the degree of legalizing this debate, but this is beyond uh, my expertise, I think. I don't know if we have someone with a legal expertise in the panel. And a last point I would like to bring to the attention of the panel is uh, the fact that we do tend to focus in uh, repatriation claims with the Western world. Uh, of course, because we have all these massive museums in, uh, West, in North Europe, the States, Canada, Scandinavian countries, etc. Uh, however, I think it is an issue that uh, has to be addressed with the context of museums abroad. The past few years, we see the growth of museum industry. China has built, I don't know, thousands of museums in the past 10 years. India and South Korea vouched last year uh, to build 140 museums each or something like that. And we see Saudi Arabia building museums and so on and so forth. So there is a question about uh, practice here, about uh, inclusivity and representation when it comes to this um, to this uh, uh, to this issue and uh, we will have to wait and see if these museums will have to face repatriation claims or other claims in the near future thank you um thank you very much uh, maria for a very interesting presentation and uh, a very good way to start off our panel discussion and i'm sure some of the topics you you raised we, we, we can um, bring them back in the in the discussion afterwards uh, i will now pass on to our second speaker dr romina istrati also from soas uh, Romina is a research associate to the Department of Development Studies and the Center of World Christianity uh, at SOAS. Um, she previously served as a senior teaching fellow uh, to the School of History, Religions and Philosophy, um, uh, teaching specifically on Sub-Saharan Africa. In fact, her expertise is on Ethiopia. Uh, her research uh, lies at the intersection of gender, religious and development and applies a decolonial perspective to gender and development practice, informed by a decade experience in community-based research in Sub-Saharan Africa. Um, she has written on the ethics of international development, Western gender, metaphysic and religious knowledge systems, um, and the discourse of fundamentalism in gender studies. Um, the her most recent research project was a, a decolonial ethnography study of conjugal abuse in the Ethiopian Orthodox Tawahado community of Aksum, which has evolved into an um, ongoing funded project called Religion, Conscience and, and Abusive Behavior, Understanding the Role of Faith and Spirituality in the Deterrence of Intimate Party Violence in Rural Ethiopia. Um, Romina is also the co-founder of the open access publishing platform, Decolonial Subversions, which I really um, 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 encourage you to, to check out because it's very, very interesting. Um, I will now uh, let uh, Romina uh, give a presentation. And then, as I said, we, we can um, uh, go back to discuss later, but please keep putting your question in the Q&A. Don't forget that. Thank you. And uh, uh, the floor is for you, Romina. Thank you, Angelica. Thank you for the generous introduction. Um, well, I, I have some slides, so I'm going to put the slides up and just let me know if uh, they're they're visible to all. I think uh, having some slides will make will make it a bit easier to follow. Is this OK? OK, I see no one complaining. <laughs> um, so thank you so much for having me. Uh, as as uh, Angelica's sort of introduction of myself suggests, I'm not grounded in archaeology or uh, you know heritage studies per se i come from an anthropological uh, sort of ethnographic point of view and so i thought uh, i thought it was appropriate to title the presentation today decolonizing heritage ethnographic insights so it's really um it, it it's uh, it's a topic that i'm really interested in on heritage and repatriation uh, one because i was raised in greece so the partner marbles were a case study that i was i grew up writing about in my you know uh, essays in school um but also because i'm based in ethiopia in aksum and aksum is you know is the center is the historical center of the aksumite kingdom which flourished uh, you know in the fourth century and um and it, you know it's a, it's an, arch an archaeological site so all these issues are very pertinent to, to my research um, 
And um, this is this is just a, a picture of uh, a photo from from my work in Aksum, uh, working primarily with clergy in the field. Um, so because my emphasis has been very much on decolonizing theory and practice in development, um, I'm 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 hoping to take an epistemological approach today. So it's really about um, questioning, perhaps, or problematizing what it means to decolonize heritage. Uh, from that point of view, from the conceptual point of view, and then the implications for practice and museums, uh, sort of linking back to Maria's presentation and the question she raised. Um, and I will, uh, I will draw because I, again, I'm, I'm an ethnographer. Uh, I'd like to draw from the, the research I have done and what that research suggests, uh, based on the discourses of the communities that I know and engage with. Um, and again, as I said, the aim is to inform these debates uh, in, in an ethnographically grounded way. You know, if we if we can't engage them. Uh, directly in this debate, then at least we can cite their discourses and, and realities um, and, and in this way decolonize the, the, the discussion itself and ourselves. Um, so in looking about definitions, uh, you know, around to see how people conceptualize decolonizing heritage, because again, this is a, uh, there's multiple, multiple ways of approaching this. Um, one definition I found, which is very interesting to me, uh, by the International Center for the Study of the Preservation and Restoration of Cultural Property, um, says, and I'll read out loud because I think it's important, uh, decolonizing is about difficult conversations and reflections on the meaning of cultural institutions and who these institutions are intended to serve. It is about open and true dialogue with all members of communities and society. It is about sharing power and authority. Decolonizing is about cultural institutions becoming learning communities, about the necessity to create room for multiple perspectives, showing the different contexts that determine how we look at objects or themes. Now, it, this definition spoke to me because I, I still recollect when I was writing my essays uh, in, in high school on why the Parthenon marbles should be repatriated. I was making the case that uh, these monuments uh, need to be appraised within their wholeness. Uh, and it, it's important for the viewer to view them from the outside as opposed to them being in a room, in a closed room, and being object objectified by the viewer. So actually a perception of the object and the relationship to the object uh, very much spoke to me in person. Um, but I thought, I thought this definition uh, kind of sets the ground for what I want to argue for. It's important to really look at cultural institutions becoming learning communities. Now, the interesting thing is that for many, uh, for many people, culture is a living organism. And, and I, I think the way we understand cultural museums might understand cultures in the Western context differ from the way communities understand culture and live it and experience it. So what I would like to argue is in uh, sort of promoting this idea of decolonizing heritage and, and thinking of practical approaches to um, question the fundamental metaphysical assumptions. So the fundamental beliefs or philosophies that underpin this idea of heritage and what is culture. And to sort of start doing that praxistically, uh, because decoloni decolonization is about uh, praxis, I kind of wanted to look at a, at a case study. Um, and this is, uh, again, built on, on my, on my uh, sort of specialization. Um, in 2019, The Atlantic published an article that was exploring, in fact, these very issues, why the British are unwilling to return national treasures, you know, to previously colonized or occupied uh, 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 you know, countries or, or nations. Uh, mentioning, you know, the Parthenon marbles in Greece, which were uh, taken uh, during um, under the Ottoman occupation, uh, and also the um, the holy treasures that were seized uh, from Ethiopia by the British Army after the Battle of Magdala uh, in April um, 1868. Um, so. In, in the article, there is uh, an Ethiopian American novelist, uh, Miaza Mengisti, who actually asks a bit lamentfully, uh, why doesn't Britain recognize that these, these items are important to Ethiopia and they truly matter as much as the most holy and historical items in Britain? Now, as a religious scholar, as someone who has really deconstructed the concept of the holy and the sacred and religion, uh, this sentence to me, um, didn't really sound exactly right because the idea of the holy does not uh, invoke the same feeling or um, sacred, you know, sacred or invaluable heritage that it does necessarily uh, in the Ethiopian Orthodox to Ahedo context uh, with which these items are linked. Uh, because the holy was the idea of the holy and the sacred was fundamentally altered, you know, by Western European enlightenment and secularization processes, begetting collective memories and understandings of British heritage, which used to be a Western Christian, Roman Catholic, very different than the ones one finds in Ethiopia today. And I, I'll take you through to understand precisely what I mean. 
uh, just before I move on, this is a crown uh, probably made in Gondor, Ethiopia um, in, in the 18, 18, uh, 18th century. It's held at Victoria and Albert Museum in London. Um, I took the picture from their blog. I hope this is fine. <laughs> but, but these are in, the, the, the items are of invaluable, uh, uh, um, incalculable uh, value. So, it, you know, they're very, very um, valuable items that are held uh, in churches and in um, um, you know, uh, uh, holy places in Ethiopia. So I thought I, I give a bit of a genealogy in, in, in terms of thinking around um, culture in the Western context, because it will set the stage. So Western Europe experienced multiple stages of historical progression, right? And these included, you know, the widely condemned abuse uh, of uh, theological authority. This used to be a Roman Catholic uh, society, uh, the, the majority of Western societies. Then Reformation struggles happened uh, in order to liberate theology from political appropriation. And then post-Reformation enlightenments multiple alignments in multiple um, uh, Western societies to take religion out of the public sphere, uh, precisely because what, as Talal Assad, uh, the Saudi Arabian anthropologist has pointed out, uh, because uh, the religious was perceived as uh, uh, risking corruption by power and therefore as being dangerous to the public sphere. So religion should, had to become a, a private thing, an issue of the private sphere. Um, now, initially, understandings of human understanding, uh, human civilization and culture and advancement, you know, what human advancement means, intertwine with this uh, theological uh, worldview that was widespread uh, in these societies. Western Christian values were oftentimes juxtaposed to local indigenous, usually pagan societies. And, you know, this fostered in combination with many other items and things and sort of, uh, uh, you know, um, the rise of na nationalist uh, identity in these societies, uh, foster essentialist representations of cultures and peoples. And as religion started to be separated from the public life because of this uh, pushback that I discussed, uh, the hiatus grew between culture and religion uh, and re culture became more secularized. And, and with this human humanistic understandings of culture, more dichotomies were increasingly introduced. So culture versus nature, mind versus body, gender versus sex, and so forth. Uh, and I'm especially interested in, in the study of culture specifically. So this is, this is how world systems and um, public life and, uh, sort of shifted in these societies. But it's also interesting to look at the concept of culture and how culture was approached in science. So with the rise of science in 18th century, you know, and sci scientism, you know, the, the, the sort of secularization of knowledge production and philosophy, uh, we have multiple shifts in how culture is approached. Um, Apologies, <laughs> that's someone um, on my on my door, but I won't answer that. Um, so in the, in the 15th and 16th centuries, uh, uh, you know, very roughly, this is a very rough genealogy. Um, early theories around the development of civilizations tend to be evolutionary, and um, so speaking about the advanced West versus primitive peoples. Uh, 16th, 17th centuries, as I said, we have a rise of nationalist and empiricist philosophies and approaches, uh, taking a more context-specific approach. Uh, and then 18th, 19th century, uh, we actually have the study of culture by anthropologists uh, being institutionalized as a discipline. And at the same time, uh, uh, around the same time, we have you know, ethnographic museums being established uh, in London, Paris, Vienna, Washington, Munich, Berlin, uh, although the Danish had uh, established one as early as uh, 1650. So up to the 20th century, uh, the study of culture focused primarily on questions of origin and evolution. And then more hermeneutical paradigms were introduced precisely because there was more interaction with diversity of cultures and peoples. Uh, you know, uh, anthropologists started taking more ethnographic approaches, more grounded approaches, and so forth. Now, why is this important? Why is this genealogy important? And why should we keep this in mind? Because I think it's important to recognize that culture within the Western context was. Uh, what I discern as a, a gradual objectification. It, it was something that, be, that was to be observed, studied, scrutinized. Um, and this is also pertinent to the, the idea of religion, which is a construct, a 19th century construct that became again, the object of study. And as, as, as an outcome of secularization and the relegation of religious beliefs uh, to, you know, from the public sphere to the private sphere. Now, this objectification of cultural religion and the demarcation actually between cultural and religion uh, is very specific to these societies and the historical events and the sort of philosophical and uh, 
uh, the evolution of philosophical thinking in these contexts, but it doesn't necessarily, it didn't necessarily happen in other societies, uh, right? Because each society has very different historical developments. Um, and I think it's also important to link this objectification of the concept of culture and the discipline of cultural, uh, you know, of studying culture, essentially anthropology, um, with the with why you know with the, with why I guess uh, there is a difference museum culture in the world. So I've noticed you know when I'm based in various African countries that people are not as much interested in 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 going to a museum to see you know to to appraise a cultural item necessarily. Uh, it it doesn't have the same appeal, the same relevance. Uh, you know it, it's not um, it's not valued in the same ways. Uh, so I think it really is important for us to maybe consider a bit more carefully how does the culture of museums that we have in Western societies, which is now, as Maria suggested, is spreading to other societies as I hear, um, is in, how is that informed by the historical approach to culture and how culture was understood in these societies? And then maybe in order to change that, we need to really deconstruct or subvert these notions of culture and heritage that are implicit. And um, now, one of these, as an anthropologist and, and uh, others who work you know, with uh, various communities uh, in the world, we know that for many communities, worldviews or cultures or whatever term you use are lived and embodied heritage. Um, and they're oftentimes embedded in religious traditions. That distinction is not made necessarily. And that tradition continues in folklore practices. So, so culture is not something that is uh, old. Uh, you know, it's not about uh, necessarily about the past, but it's something that continues within a uh, once embodied practice every day in the vernacular uh, reality. Uh, so heritage is not something that is dead or of the past, but it's lived and experienced and has relevance today to those communities. Um, so, uh, you know, to go back to this idea of the holy and the sacred, it's really important to remember that the, the way the holy or the sacred is understood, you know, for the Ethiopians, the, the, those items were holy because they have a different meaning today um, Precisely because the holy uh, was understood, you know, uh, did not necessarily undergo the secularization processes uh, and the banishment from the public life. Um, so I'll make that clear. I'll, I'll come back to that um, in a minute. Um, so, so if we were to look at the Ethiopian Orthodox Diet community in which I'm based in Aksum in northern Ethiopia, uh, I, I was fortunate to conduct this research. I was about uh, six months in the countryside where I lived uh, with, uh, you know, with the community. And, and we spoke a lot about the religious tradition and the life of the people, of course. Uh, I was looking at conjugal abuse, but you know, obviously this was ethnographic comprehensive research. Uh, and when people spoke about heritage, uh, or when they spoke about their uh, Ethiopian Orthodox tradition, uh, which was part of the wider vernacular life, the cultural life, the societal reality, uh, they spoke of it as heritage. Um, and they saw this as indivisible, or sometimes as one of the same, uh, one and the same with the religious tradition. Uh, which traces back to the fourth century in the kingdom of Aksum when it was formally introduced. So it has a very long history and it's considered the people's indigenous tradition uh, that defines their identity and uh, you know, belonging. Um, so you know, religious idiom uh, continues in everyday life in the vernacular practices of the people, in sociocultural norms and in behavioral norms and in people's attitudes. And it's really uh, something that, as I said, gives people a sense of identity um, and, and um, a you know, roots, um, it gives them roots to something that they value and that um, uh, helps them to, uh, you know, gives them a sense of identity. This is the church of uh, Mary of Zion, Mariam Tion in Aksum. Uh, during Holy Week, people will come for the whole week, uh, pray and fast. Um, these are the obelis obelisks in Aksum, uh, the one that is standing, uh, th these were established again in, in the, around the fourth century uh, by Emperor Rosanna, uh, who was the one who formally introduced uh, Ethiopian Orthodox Christianity in the country. Uh, the, the longest, the tallest obelisk is I believe 24 meters. Uh, the one that you see uh, down, um, uh, uh, I think that was the, the longest one, 33 meters. Um, so obviously these obelisks are again, are very much valued and um, connected to the people's heritage and history, a uh, religious history. Now, with all this in mind, it, we can then go back and revisit the British looting at Magdala that Miaza was lamentably asking about. You know, why don't the British understand what these items mean to the people to return them? Well, they don't understand it because they don't have the same sense of holiness that the people in Ethiopia might have. 
that, that's my argument. So just to say a little bit about the looting, uh, this occurred after the Ethiopian uh, soldiers led by the monarch of the country, Theodorus, lost in battle and then Theodorus committed suicide. And subsequently the British uh, sol soldiers pillaged, you know, the citadel of the, of the diseased monarch, his treasury, a uh, nearby church, um, which held valuable items. Uh, and the boot included innumerable items uh, of, again, uh, you know, invaluable um, uh, measure, uh, you know, religious manuscripts, sacred ecclesiastical items, the tabots, these are the plates that define the church. So without the tabot, a church is not a church really, um, icons and very other, you know, silver uh, and gold uh, items. And, and they have historical, so this, this, these, uh, this event, I guess, is very important to people because Theodoros' defiance, you know, his decision to commit sacrifice as opposed to uh, surrender is considered, you know, a, a moment of historical pride. It's something that um, serves as a reminder of an instance of defiance, especially in an era when colonialism was rising. You know, the scramble of Africa would happen in 1884 very soon. So you can imagine what memories this event triggers to the people. Um, and it also invokes, again, the indigenous heritage, uh, religious heritage of the country, right? It's, these are religious items that have a holy, holy meaning uh, and you know, people might not necessarily know the, the theological interpretation or what exactly they, they mean, but, but they hold them very dear uh, because it's their sacred tradition. So I would say on the basis of this case, it's really important to try and take a historiographical, ethnographic approach uh, when we try to understand uh, what culture means to people, what heritage means to people or different communities um, and, and learn from that and see how we can perhaps uh, sort of adapt our ways uh, whether it is practitioners, researchers, or museums, uh, in order to, um, you know, better, better um, uh, respond to these notions of, of culture and, and heritage. Uh, so already, uh, as Maria sort of pointed out, decolonial and critical thinkers, archaeologists, practitioners, activists of all sorts, have made uh, efforts to engage more substantively with communities, uh, whether it is in excavation and preservation of activities or in the production of historical narratives about artifacts or monuments and what these mean to them. Uh, but I would argue that in parallel, we need a radical reconsideration of fundamental concepts, uh, especially culture, and to question to what degree the concept of culture as upheld or assumed by British museums, by Western interlocutors of all sorts, reflects how uh, the non-Western communities or the communities in question, they may be Western as well of a different sort of um, belief system or, or you know, um, different historical developments, how they understand and live it. So when British museums attune their understandings to the understandings of communities, there might be possibilities for something better, for change. Um, it's important to predicate those conceptualizations of heritage to the embodied historical memories of communities uh, and this obviously requires engaging with communities and their deeper belief in knowledge systems, uh, not superficially, but actually uh, trying to understand their own lived realities and memories of their own lived realities through their own discourses. And that means speaking the local languages, documenting oral histories, uh, reading local texts and manuscripts, uh, and spending time with people to understand what uh, in the same spaces uh, with the same artifacts, monuments, uh, or, you know, um, items that are important to them. So I think as scholars, speaking to our panelists and being at source, uh, we have a responsibility to use our epistemic power with reflexivity uh, of, of, of the sort of West-centric theories that we oftentimes still use, uh, maybe um, unintentionally, and then facilitate this community-based historiography uh, and, and uh, storytelling and, um, you know, analysis or, or um, uh, um, uh, you know, engagement with culture or cultural analysis, I guess, through the eyes and through the words uh, of local communities. And I'll stop here. <laughs> Thank you so much. I hope I didn't go too much over time, Angelica. Uh, thank you, Romina. Thank you very much for this very, very interesting presentation and so rich um, and in depth. And uh, um, you went a little bit over time, but that's okay because it was so interesting anyway, so that's fine. Um, now I will quickly pass on to our next speaker because, uh, as I said, we still have two speakers to, um, to hear from and then we still want to have a little bit of time for Q&A. Um, our next speaker is uh, Christian Luz. Sorry if I mispronounced your surname. Uh, is uh, Christian is um, a lecturer at SOAS.
and um, in um, in the department in the school of art um, and uh, he studied his specialization is tibetan and buddhist studies um, he, that's where he gained his phd at the university of vienna at the institute of tibetan and buddhist studies there um, after completing his PhD under the uh, supervision of the late Maurizio Taddei, uh, that I'm very pleased to, to read this because I met Maurizio Taddei. I also studied at Instituto Universal Orientale in Napoli. And so I know the standing of Taddei. And Christian, you know, it's great to hear that you, you work on the, uh, the late professor. Following his PhD, he held research position at the University of Vienna. Um, the Austrian Academy of Science, as well as the Lumbini International Research Institute. Um, he held visiting professorship um, in the US at Berkeley, uh, also at the Free University in Berlin and Stanford University um, as well. Uh, while teaching in Berlin, uh, Christian uh, also curated the exhibition Gandhara, the Buddhist heritage of Pakistan, legend, monasteries and paradise. Um, at the, sorry, I can't really pronounce this very long uh, German word, is the Kurs and um, Ostulag, um, something in Bonn. Perhaps, Christian, you might um, uh, pronounce it for me when you start your presentation. Uh, he worked together with Michael Janssen and was responsible for its catalog. Before joining SOAS, he was senior curator at the Ruby Museum of Art in New York. So again, we have um, an academic who was also a practitioner. Uh, so again, we're very interesting to hear the intersection. Um, I am not going to read uh, uh, the entire abstract that uh, Christian gave me. Uh, I will leave it to him uh, to embed it in his, his presentation because I don't want to take um, more time. So I'll now uh, give the floor to Christian uh, to talk about the Tibetan uh, Buddhist monastery collections today. Thank you, Christian. Thanks a lot. Uh, I should have given a kind of introduction to my name to cross out the first C, then wow. it's it, which is relatively easy to pronounce then. And uh, the other uh, terminology that you asked was the Kunst and Ausstellungshalle of Germany in, in Bonn. That's where the, the exhibition was. Uh, I'm going to share my uh, screen as well with a short uh, presentation. So, and I hope that's uh, visible now. And uh, talk about, I will talk uh, about my research project that is currently running. I introduced that and then uh, Kind of put up some questions that are more broadly addressing uh, this particular panel. Uh, so I have a research project uh, that is called Tibetan Buddhist Monastery Collections today uh, and uh, more recently was AHRC funded. It works in uh, two areas of the Himalayas and rather remote areas in that sense, uh, namely Lomantang, which is about the center of the map, and Ladakh uh, in the upper uh, left corner of the map here, uh, both uh, rather remote and rural areas in, in the Himalayas with uh, monasteries scattered throughout the region. And uh, what I'm essentially doing is I'm going to monasteries and uh, document uh, the collections uh, that they have. And uh, I'll do that since uh, 2012 with the uh, uh, first explorations that were still uh, done when I was uh, curator at the Rubin Museum of Art. And I continued uh, that project uh, when I came to SOAS in 2014. 2016 to this year, uh, the project was EHRC funded. And essentially, I'll uh, go uh, every year to both regions, Ladakh in India, as well as Mustang in present day Nepal, and engage the monasteries in questions of man management, uh, preservation, and display. And on the picture, you see essentially a traditional <laughs> display as we found it in 2012 
in Namgyal Monastery. Uh, one of the most important works that we do is documentation. So we'll simply uh, document all the portable artworks, including books, uh, and uh, consequently or subsequently uh, give inventories uh, to the monastery. Not all of these inventories are done uh, database. In, the, in this particular database, it really depends. And, and in most cases, we we'll, can only give a, a printout to the monastery uh, simply because uh, they are not, uh, they don't have the, the object management system. With this work, there, there was kind of an interesting change observed from from uh, in terms of the display of, of the objects, because traditionally uh, Tibetan Buddhist monasteries have quite literally been stuffed with objects that were accessible to the general public. And on the left side, we have a picture uh, uh, taken in 1981 at Hemis Monastery in Ladakh, uh, where we see the entire space kind of filled with different types of sculptures. And two of these sculptures, which are in the foreground, are today in the Monastery Museum, the Hemis Monastery Museum, which opened in uh, 2007. And it just gives a good relationship about. Uh, or of the difference between these, these uh, spaces, but also that the modern display essentially copies Western museum display with uh, traditional furniture. And equally, uh, if the monasteries are needed, we'll also help them in creating such spaces. And we did that uh, in particular for one uh, monastery that. Uh, is close to him is in Ladakh, it's called Chemre. And these were the plants and the case plants that uh, we made for the new display. And this actually shows the transformation of a space that clearly was not created as a museum space, but they wanted to use as a museum space. Uh, the plan for the display, the making of the cases, which were uh, made locally, and uh, then after the installation of the objects in 2019. So you see uh, the pictures here from 2016 uh, to 2019. And uh, of course, now I can kind of look back at, at uh, it years of experience uh, in this work. And I think there, there are a few interesting observations that I can make. In my, these regions are remote. Uh, Mustang hasn't had a road access uh, until maybe three years ago, uh, permanent road access. And even then in summer, it's usually down. Uh, but nevertheless, uh, the recent decades have seen a lot of modernization. And that modernization affects the heritage uh, of uh, these places very severely. And I think uh, it's in part driven by uh, outside funding, as well as uh, the leading monks uh, being actually uh, very well traveled and seeing modern institutions uh, elsewhere. And uh, there is something, and I'll just put that out uh, there, uh, what I would uh, kind of, what one could call a kind of self-colonization process going on in the sense that uh, the, mo the monasteries essentially attempt to copy Western museums uh, and want to build museums within the, their structures. In Ladakh, that's more advanced and we have seen the examples already. In Mustang, the idea is circulating and uh, plans in this regard as well. And it's interesting to note that most of this happens uh, through the possibilities that outside funding offers. Uh, 
usually, of course, uh, very well meant outside funding, but that also uh, results in destruction of heritage. A good example here is the restoration of uh, Jodo Monastery in Lomantang, uh, taken in 2015, where they essentially broke through the, the 15th century wall to create a new entrance and enable the construction of a concrete building inside uh, the monastery, which of course is hardly usable in winter at an altitude of 3,800 meters and with uh, very low uh, nighttime temperatures. Uh, the other observations I wanted to make are those about uh, potential of repatriation uh, that or thoughts about repatriation that come out of the project. Uh, and in principle, in some collections, I could say, yes, I know that uh, from, from this particular monastery, there is a set of objects of which, let's say, five sculptures are missing. And if uh, any of these five sculptures would be found, it would make perfect sense to actually repatriate it to the monastery itself and essentially re reunite the set of sculptures it was originally made for. But uh, it's, uh, I, I also had uh, may have made the observation that objects are also spread within the region itself. Uh, so for example, I have documented a whole set of books uh, at one monastery, but one particular set of book covers in another monastery. Does that need to be repatriated then uh, in this case? Uh, and and uh, the, the, another example is actually that one particular sculptural set seems to, spread, to be spread across many uh, monasteries. Uh, I have now, I think it was probably once 20 to 24 objects. And uh, it spread uh, across, uh, I've identified uh, seven objects uh, across three uh, different monasteries. Uh, so, so obviously uh, this particular set has been spread within the region. And uh, what would be the, well, what would one do in these cases? And so I think uh, what this example, uh, is kind of supposed to demonstrate is the problems that you may actually encounter when you go there. And with our ideas of, of uh, museum uh, world and, and uh, repatriation, but what actually uh, kind of happens or what you may find out may actually be quite uh, different. And in a way it's still, a very strong Western influence. And it's rather me who tries, for example, not to build a museum, but to, to, uh, to uh, argue for a traditional display, but with kind of certain security features attached to it. These are precious objects. So they're always afraid uh, for, of them uh, to be stolen. And for that reason, the Hamish objects weren't accessible between the early 80s and 2007, the opening of the museum itself. And they weren't accessible even for the local uh, worshippers of the monastery. And so in, in a way, the museum opened the possibility to show these objects again. But all the att attempts I made over the last eight years in essentially furthering traditional uh, display were kind of in vain uh, because what they want is to show uh, that they are modern institutions and that they can have a museum just like we have in the West. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Christians. Uh, excellent presentation. A lot of, um, yes, things to think about.
uh, especially in terms of yeah how do we do repatriation is easily said than done but we have we can discuss this more in, in a little bit um again mindful of time i don't want to take too much of my of time and um i am now going to introduce our last speaker uh, and then after the last presentation, I will call back uh, the panelists, uh, Barry Maria, because I believe that Maria, she had to leave uh, at 12 o'clock. So unfortunately we won't have her in the conversation, but if there are specific questions for her, we can then pass them on. Uh, I am very pleased to welcome here uh, Dawa Lokitsang. Uh, good morning, I would say, because she's based in the US, therefore she just woken up. Um, so welcome Dawa uh, to our panel today. A brief introduction, Bawa, uh, Dawa is a PhD candidate in the field of cultural anthropology at the University of Colorado uh, in the USA. Uh, her dissertation research is on the establishment of sovereignty in exile by Tibetan refugees through the development of their own educational institutions and the larger diaspora community of Tibetans in India. In addition to her research focus, she's also interested in, in, in and has written um, about uh, ways of belonging that are uh, racialized and gendered within the Tibetan diaspora community. Um, um, Dawa is also concerned with the questions of Chinese settler colonialism and its impact on Tibetan su um, su subjectivities in colonized Tibet. Um, so in a sense, Chinese imperialism more broadly, and the need for uh, decolonization as a necessary practice still in Fanon fashion for counteracting such ongoing uh, mechanics of racialized modern colonialism and imperialism. The scholarly writing have been featured in Lexington books with forthcoming work with Duke University Press and Oxford University Press. Uh, occasionally, she writes for Laka Diaries, a well-liked blog run by and for Tibetans, of which she's a co-founder. Um, Laka Diaries is also where you will find most of her writing, so please do check the, the blog out as well. Um, I will now pass on to Daka to, uh, Dawa. Sorry, I'm keep, um, mixing your name. Uh, I'll um, uh, to give her a presentation, and then we can reconvene for the Q&A. There you go, Dawa, the flow is yours. Thank you. Oh, thank you for that introduction um, and thank you for the panelists for today's um, talk. Um, I'm going to go straight to my uh, PowerPoint presentation and I'm going to read my presentation. Uh, how do I, okay, doing this right now. Um, so I just, one second, having technical issues. I just do share button and I'm getting- Share screen. I'm getting many different options, just desk board, whiteboard. Do I just click any of them? Yes. <clears throat> You, you um, have to find your PowerPoint. You've got different option, then you click on the one of the PowerPoint. Um, okay, Microsoft PowerPoint. It's asking me you for have, all kinds. You have to open the PowerPoint first. It's open. Okay. Um, I'm just not sure how to share it. At the bottom, uh, do you see share screen? In green? Yes. I'm just getting a lot of different options. Desk, desktop one, iPad, uh, my, okay, it says. Um, perhaps if you can email it to Stephanie. Okay, I'll do it right now. Yeah, uh, sg96 at soal.ac.uk. And then she will be able to share, to share it for you, that's fine. Okay. No problem. Sorry about that. Okay. We're all very new with this technology. Yeah, I'm <laughs> just, just completely new. <laughs> so that's okay. Just send it to Stephanie and then um, 
she will just be able to share it for us. Okay, um, so I just that's okay. Just emailed it. Um, yes, thank you. Yep. <laughs> and I'll just motion every time I need to change the slide. Yes, you can say next. Okay. So just just a few minutes to uh, upload it. Um, there with us audience and um, uh, yeah so uh, Dawa will speak for about 10-15 minutes um, and then mm -hmm. that will leave us um, about um, 20 minutes for Q&A. Uh, I can see there's quite a, a few very interesting questions. Um, I'll hope to get through if you know as many as I can but <clears throat> given the time constraint I might not be able to answer them all. And if not, um, please, you can still say that. Oh, there we go. Okay. Mm -hmm. There we go. This is the presentation. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Stephanie. Um, I'm just, I'm going to go ahead and read it without the camera. Yeah. So okay. next. What does it mean to be a responsible scholar? attuned to decolonization as a method responsible as a method responsible to whom when and why i'm struck by how simple yet complex this question is for me to answer easy because i'm a native scholar doing work with my own community i know to whom i am responsible and my community's path towards self-determination is closely tied to my own liberation thus the kind of work i produce impact my community and myself directly so a question of who I am responsible to is not a hard one for me to answer. However, working with the community with whom I am from does not guarantee I will not produce work that the Nepali scholar Bista describes as an insecure and thoughtless mimicry of the West. In fact, in demystifying some ethnographic texts on the, Himalaya, on the Himalayas, Podar and Suba make clear that native scholars are not free from producing Orientalist discourses. However, scholars who work with communities that they are from, I argue, are more mindful of this critique for they have familial and communal ties that can easily be threatened due to works that may be perceived as harmful to the collective. This also brings up the question of positionality for native scholars. Native scholars are tied to their community and so are susceptible to such works of harm, which I argue force them to be less blind to perspectives of privilege. Thus, I do not see myself as having a choice over having responsibility. Rather, familial and communal bonds demand that I serve my obligation as a member of this community to produce work that is healing. In this response, I seek to decenter the framing logics of anthropological ethics by asking, what happens when the question of responsibility becomes one of obligation? Choice becomes necessity and crisis exists as an everyday reality. As Mohawk anthropologist Audra Simpson argues, it is important not to fall into the delegitimizing trap of justifying native scholarship on the basis of identity politics and justice alone. Next. This matters, but a deeper re reason relates to the ways in which Simpson engaged the distinction between resistance and refusal with event and structure. This cuts to the heart of the question. Ethical anthropologists are encouraged to do, to do the right thing through the logic of ethics for the very reason they don't have to. However, like refusal, obligation, necessity, and everyday realities are the non-episodic qualities that structure the daily lives of indigenous peoples, researchers, or otherwise. By naming refusal, Simpson has not presented a new fashionable anthropological turn. While her conceptualization is novel and valuable, the reality of refusal, according to Simpson, is something that indigenous people have experienced throughout the history of colonization. If colonization was an event, then resistance would be enough. It's not. Next slide. As Patrick Wolf notes, colonization was and remains structural. Therefore, modes of decolonization must too be structural. If we truly want to decolonize, we must reimagine legacies of episodic conceptualization as structural and move away from resisting colonial encounters by ethical outsiders. 
towards the refusal of colonial structure, structures by obligated stakeholders for whom non-obligatory ethics loses all meaning. Next slide. For guidance, I turn to decolonization methodologies by Maori scholar Linda Tuhiwai Smith, another native scholar doing work with her own community and a leading theorist on decolonizing methods. Smith problematizes Euro-Western approaches to research that she argues has historically served to essentialize communities and assist those in power in their project to further colonization, a system she terms colonizing knowledges. In order to avoid this, she proposes research that is decolonial in method. For research to be truly decolonial, it must, argue Smith, prioritize indigenous voices, histories, epistemologies, and their struggle against settler colonialism. In other words, research that orients itself around indigenous people and their thought and struggles first and foremost. Such an approach that Smith stresses must be collaborative and can lead to healing of the research and a wider scope of representation for the voices of the dispossessed, disenfranchised, colonized other in the research process. The goal, she writes, is to make them visible and integrate them in the academic discourse and the global knowledge economy. Thus, for me to produce responsible scholarship on the community from whom I'm from, my obligation requires me to produce decolonized work that centers them and their struggles and concerns. It requires indigenous scholars such as myself, R.B. Smith, to be ethical, critical, respectful, reflexive, and most of all, humble, so that native scholars may hear members of their community when they are speaking. Next. In 2012, the number of Tibetans who chose to self immolate in Tibet began to increase at an alarming rate. Although the first Tibetan to set himself a fire to protest in Tibet took place in 2009, Following the 2008 uprising, which was the largest recorded protest in Tibetan history across the three provinces of Tibet, the number of Tibetans self-immolating jumped at an increasing rate from one in 2009 to 14 in 2011 to 86 in 2012. There were one or two self-immolations taking place almost every week during the winter of 2012. If one understands the self-immolations as episodic, it takes away its deeper relationship with settler colonialism, which is not episodic. Tibetans across the world reacted emotionally and in unison to this act because this is a physical manifestation of their everyday life and history. Tibetans organized at all levels to amplify the voices of the self, self emulators so that their protests were seen and heard inside and outside Tibet. During this time, scholars of Tibet and the Himalayas stepped forward to take scholarly responsibility to address the misrepresentation of self immolations of Tibetans in the media. Next. On April 9th, 2012, American anthropologist McGranahan and Litzinger edited a series of essays on the self immolation titled Self Immolation as Protest in Tibet. Months later, French Tibetologists Buffatrill and Robin edited Tibet is Burning on December 14th, 2012. I consider these works to be decolonial because they tried to strengthen the voices of the self emulators by giving their actions socioeconomic, religious, political, and historical context, trying to, in Smith's words, make them visible and integrate them in the academic discourse and the global knowledge economy. Rather than take an objective stance, scholars came together to use learned knowledges from their subjects to engage larger conversations that contextualized individual self emulators and their protests as the act took place. This was scholarship that drew on knowledges of indigenous pasts to make sense of their individual presence, especially during moments in which the baseline daily structural violence manifested in ways that were read internationally as episodic human tragedy. But where does my work as a native scholar fit into all of this? Next. In indigenous feminism, Suzak and Hondrup make the argument that for any work to be considered decolonial, such works need to first center settler colonialism. As the number of self immolations in Tibet began to slowly rise in 2011, I began addressing individual self emulators by intentionally placing them within the discourse of Chinese settler colonialism on Pakar Diaries, a blog I run with other Tibetans to serve as a platform for Tibetan thought by us, for us. However, the alarming rise in numbers in 2012 put me in a constant state of anxiety, especially when I felt so far away from friends and family who were engaged in practices of commemoration and solidarity. 
I made every effort to bring up self immolations as they took place in every space I was engaged. Next. On April 11, 2012, I was invited by a friend to give a targeted talk on the self immolations as these acts were virtually unknown at my university. I felt obligated in the positive generative sense to amplify their calls to action. Following this, I wrote another post on Pakar Diaries, giving an outline of my talk for others interested in doing something similar for public awareness. In all these posts and talks, I situated individual self emulators against the backdrop of Chinese settler colonialism. Next. In indigenous feminism, the project, Hilden and Lee argued that to decolonize, one needs to reclaim, reread, and rearticulate indigenous peoples from the past and the present, whose voices are always being misrepresented or erased. Next. I published the essay, Their Burning Bodies Told Histories Never Forgotten, on December 18, 2013. The essay was my attempt to write against colonizing narrative on the self immolations by the Chinese state, as well as to speak with rather than for the self immolators. Next. Aside from few scholars, most reports of the, on the self immolations and scholarship and media until then had mostly focused solely on just the act and very little attention had been paid to whom the self emulators are, were speaking and the structures that they were speaking about. The article was my attempt to write about the self emulators and the audience they were speaking to. It was my attempt to reclaim, rewrite and rearticulate self, -emulation, self emulators and their multiple audiences. This according to Hilden and Lee is how I am able to begin the process of healing of the research, myself included. The reason I go through this timeline is to demonstrate how my role as a native scholar requires me to always address present circumstances of the Tibetan community at all times. The position of colonized Tibetan, a refugee exiled Tibetan suggests a positioning of crisis that isn't episodic, but an everyday structural affair. I consider the historical approach I have adopted over the course of my progression as a scholar to be a method to decolonize. Next. It is a method that has helped me center the voices and subjectivities of Tibetans in the present using their memories of the past, a method many indigenous scholars stress. It, is, it also allows me to engage Tibetan past in order to make sense of Tibetan presence so that we may collectively engage in imagining Tibetan futures, an engagement that indigenous scholars argue preoccupies itself with the project of healing. For my work to be truly decolonial, it must engage the concerns of my, of my community at all times because it engages the futures of not just myself, but my family and thus my community. Decolonized work suggests pathways towards individual and communal healing. This is how I view my obligation as a native scholar doing work with my own community. As such, I invite researchers to consider a structurally decolonizing praxis this would not only involve theories and methods generated by community members with whom you work, it would also employ the genealogy of works produced by indigenous scholars over the last 40 years. The contributions made by such scholars often remain inaccessible in our disciplines, yet they offer, offer ways of approaching questions regarding ethics and responsibility that anthropology and other disciplines often consider important. Next. Having engaged refusal, we might ask a larger disciplinary question beyond the level of the individual. What happens when scholarly ethics becomes disciplinary obligations embedded into the ethnographic process itself to refuse the everyday structures of ever-present colonization? Next. Um, so this is my presentation, thank you. Um, thank you very much, um, Dawa. Thank you for your presentation. Very interesting and, uh, you know, very sort of in line also with Christian. So it was good to see, um, you know, representation across uh, from Africa and Asia um, in this panel. I will now um, call back the panelists. If you can um, come back to us by um, unmuting and, um, and putting your video on again. Um, I will now uh, read through uh, some of the questions that came into the chat, into the Q&A, um, and um, perhaps you can feel free to, to answer some of these questions as you feel comfortable. Um, 
Uh, okay, so uh, there is a, some question about, um, there is a specific question um, that asks about the Koh-i-Noor diamond. What about the Koh-i-Noor diamond and others in the Queen's crown? In the panel opinion, should they be returned to India? Uh, is anyone willing to ask any question, Christian or Dawa, perhaps? Or Mina, I mean, or anyone? <laughs> Are you happy to answer this or shall I take a few more? It's up to you. Hello? I don't know. I don't think we should kind of take single objects and decide <laughs> where they should be. Uh, this is a discourse, obviously, uh, in, in many ways. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Um, uh, there are some question about um, um, isn't the practice of self colonization building <clears throat> on museums in non Western community communities uh, practice as a way to haste the repatriation of the artifacts. This is a question for uh, for Christian specifically. Maybe on a state level, yes, uh, I would assume so that, uh, but I think not necessarily at the monastery level. And I, uh, I forgot to kind of mention that at least in Nepal, it's the case that the, the ownership of the objects is not entirely clear. <laughs> so, so theoretically, the state could always claim the object uh, for anything, it seems. And there is a, a kind of certain insecurity in terms of the laws regarding the objects and uh, what the ro role the state could play uh, within that. And so it's mostly a cultural basis. And then you have in countries like whatever, in, in both Nepal and India, you have also the, the tensions between the ruling uh, or the state itself and, and, and the minority within it <laughs> that, of course, uh, sees the, itself quite independent of, of the state as such. Yeah, that okay. also needs to be considered. Yeah. Uh, we have two questions for Romina, and then I can see Romina also, she wants to comment on this one. But Romina, uh, there are two questions for you. Um, uh, the first is, may I discuss your definition of heritage in Ethiopia? Uh, I have a different experience when discussing this in Ethiopia. And the second one for Romina is, how can the involvement of local communities suggested by you in excavation and preservation activities led by critical, nonetheless European researchers, invert or even really subvert the colonial relationship of the epistemically advantaged Roving Orientalism with a narrative, with a native informant or assistant. So okay. Romina, perhaps, yeah, you can comment on the previous one and then answer this question. Excellent Thank questions. I, I think the first one was from Dorothea. Um, I, I would love to hear how, what kind of uh, insights Dorothea uh, hear from her interlocutors because it differs. Uh, Dorothea, I don't know where you are based. Uh, it differs, you know, Ethiopia um, uh, has multiple ethnic um, sort of cultural and ethnic groups and you know depending on the religious tradition depending on the culture people might perceive it differently uh, hence i did um, sort of emphasize that it's one has to take a context specific approach in this research because the emphasis all was on the religious tradition i think it um, people sort of felt um that it would be relevant to invoke the religious tradition first when they thought about heritage, right? So maybe if we had a different kind of conversation where, you know, uh, the topic or the emphasis was not on the religious tradition, maybe they would approach it differently. So obviously discourse matters. And this is the, I think the important um, element in ethnography that one needs to be aware of how one introduces a topic, right? In what context uh, and, and understand that the way you ask the question or the way uh, the topic is introduced will influence how people respond, right? So I think there is a limitation that one needs to get to, to be reminded of. So thank you so much. Uh, I'd love, you know, if you want to join uh, and just ask your question, if it's possible, I'd love to hear. And then on the second one, uh, I think it's a brilliant, excellent question. You know, what is our role? I come from Eastern Europe, by the way, you know, we were, we had our own uh, experiences of being colonized and occupied. So I, I do understand um, 
you, you know, I have, a, I'm not necessarily a Western researcher, but I am based in the West. So of course that, you know, the affiliation and the ge geographical position uh, makes me sort of complicit in, in the coloniality that continues. So I'm very much aware of it, uh, but I also have my own positionality, which, you know, is also from a different region. And the, those two positionalities informed also my approach. And my approach was really about placing emphasis on the linguistic and conceptual repertoires of the community as much as possible speaking of languages. So I, I was trained in, in three of the languages that were relevant, uh, two of which I speak uh, quite fluently, um, Tigrinya Amharic and the ecclesiastical language Gaz, just to be able to access manuscripts and, and uh, religious texts. Um, and so language was very, very important because it's the means of communication. And the other uh, important sort of um, element is the methodologies, as Dawa mentioned, uh, you know, uh, uh, Linda Tihuay Smith's work about decolonizing uh, methodologies, you know, being reflexive and using methodologies that allow the community to really voice their own understandings without preconceiving those or giving them the language to do so, a language that is foreign. Uh, so for my research, I used very much participatory workshops. So instead, instead of the standardized standard anthropological approach where you just observe or you, 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 you know, presumably in a distance manner, I was very much involved uh, very much lived with the community, spoke the languages uh, to the best of my ability and used participatory methods. So workshops where the community were invited to define their own topics, their own language uh, and their own ways of analyzing their own experiences. So it was very much exploratory. And I think again, going back to Dawa's point, uh, humility. I think, look, we can't uh, avoid who we are. We can't skew the power dynamics we are embedded in. But I think if there is humility, uh, and we understand our own biases and challenge those as we go along the way constantly, and we want to listen to what we, we're being told, then I think there is possibilities to do, to do subvert the system. But of course, we kind of skew it all together. I hope this answered the questions. Yes. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Romina. Uh, Dawa, uh, please come in to comment. Thank you. Um, yeah, I just wanted to say that um, it's kind of in relation to what both panelists just, who just went. and my emphasis was about positionality and the fact that um, how, how we frame researchers, um, you know, meaningful ways of approaching research that's ethical. I'm also questioning whether, you know, these are just episodic kind of, you know, reactions versus how do we make them more structural? Uh, how do we do ethical um, research that isn't just based off of how we, you know, how we'd like to do research, rather how do we make these standard practices that are you know, obligations rather than just choices. Um, but also like I'm, I'm, I'm a little familiar with Nepal and, uh, um, and Ladakh. And um, as Dr. Um, Christian just spoke, um, positionality there is also extremely important to consider in terms of the state versus local community. How much jurisdiction does the state have over um, ways in which uh, communities want to approach development of museums, um, but also, you know, like in terms of um, like autonomy over a decision making process. And even within the community, there's also positionality in terms of hierarchies of who gets to make these decisions. So I also think there needs to be, um, you know, attention paid to the state versus local whether they're colonial or not dynamics and who really gets to make decisions about museums. But I also think there needs to be room for local community to be hybrid. I think there is a tendency to make natives seem as if they're static in time. If they wanna museumize, I mean, I will say Tibetan refugees have been very good in the exiled Tibetan community to weaponize museums to tell their own narratives. This can be said for indigenous communities doing the same who want to center settler colonialism as an avenue for telling the development of their current situation and community's history. Mm -hmm. So I think, um, you know, a larger uh, way of looking at this needs to be uh, closely uh, um, paid attention to positionality and the question of ethics, you know, mm -hmm. um, whether it's choice or it should be structural. Angelica, you're muted. <laughs> sorry, sorry. And I was just say thank you, Dawa. It's very important to emphasize uh, uh, this important this question about ethic and what do we mean by engaging the community because sometimes they can be maybe slogans rather than actual practices. Um, going on with the questions, uh, going back sort of the, the bigger topics of uh, 
uh, repatriation of cultural heritage. We have one question for all panel members. Um, uh, they ask, how would you approach a discussion with the British Museum about repatriation of cultural heritage material to traditional owners? What would be your main arguments? Um, and I just wanted to add here that it will be interesting for you to um, come in on Friday as well, because on Friday we specifically talking about the return of the icons. I recommend everybody to read the report. Uh, which you know is specifically bringing us example, and the British Museum is involved in this conversation. Uh, so, but again, yeah, it's quite complex, and I will let the uh, the panelists to come in and, um, and and shed some light. Yes, Romina, you want to start? Sure. I mean, I'm happy to share some thoughts because I've followed these debates. So I was um, a participant um, last year uh, at the. Um, uh, European Association of Archaeology on the decolonizing panel. So it was the first panel that was ever held on decolonizing archaeology um, in Europe. And this this very much question, this question came up, the same question, how do we, um, what do we do when, you know, perhaps as researchers, as activists, when we communicate with museums to, to make a convincing argument. Um, and there's multiple sort of um, uh, 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 responses that museums can give, right? They will say that if we return one item, it will set a precedent and then it will sort of, you know, everyone will, uh, essentially everyone will ask their items back and then their museums will be emptied. So this is sort of the argument that they often use to discourage uh, that, you know, that thinking in, in the thinking in that direction of repatriation. Uh, but I think uh, the, the best approach that I have heard in the various debates I heard is that uh, we let communities make their own demands and decide where you know if there are debated items uh, or items that have been taken you know uh, go back to the communities and discuss dialogically and participatorily on what the approach should be and how this you know um in conversation with the community so you know there might be a community that might say actually it's better to to let the item rest in the british museum because it's safer or you know we're fine with an arrangement that you know we can loan to each other so what I think the approach here is not necessarily to say that there is um, a one size fits all, right? And actually um, encourage museums to have that conversation with the different communities to, to not see it monolithically, but actually look at the context in each case and appraise it in conversation. I mean, I think that's a, that's a sort of a practical approach, but I'd like to hear the other panelists. I'm really curious. Yeah. Um, thank you so much, Romina. I just wanted to add that, yes, uh, the conversation with communities, but I would say perhaps the conversation should also be with state museums in the country we're talking about, because at the end of the day, I'm not sure communities can actually receive objects, whereas museums in those countries, for instance, I did some work with the Museum um, of Dar es Salaam or the museum in uh, Nairobi. You know, I think the conversation had to be also at that institutional level. Uh, mm -hmm. with the involvement of the Ministry of Education and at that kind of high level, because here is the British Museum is this kind of high level institution and we can expect an equal partnership with, you know, uh, communities that don't have that kind of level of power, whereas perhaps museum practitioners and museum directors and Ministry of Edu Education and Cultures uh, in, in, in specific countries, uh, I would believe that might become more effective, but also there is a lot of issue around the legality and also, as you said, about the way in which preservation can take place. So it's quite complex, uh, different way, uh, layers of... Yeah. I, I mean, just to add that communities often do have sort of informal institutions that represent them that are not equivalent Absolutely. to the Western institutions. So I think even the concept of institution differs that we need yes. to yeah, be aware of. Absolutely. Uh, there you, Christian Dawa, do you want to come in on this, talk, on this uh, issue? how you see actual practices of repatriation within yeah. your research areas yeah no I, I i think as a background i think it's important to know in, in this context that him across the himalayas objects disappeared <laughs> uh, for decades mm -hmm. but they have no evidence for it and so it's practically impossible to go back for them to go back and say you know this was in the uh the prayer room of this and this house we want to have it back <laughs> and it won't work uh, that way and this is one of the reasons why i do the documentation at the first place to ensure that they have evidence for what they own <laughs> and uh, evidence of what they own is of course the most important <laughs> element that you can bring in uh, to this discussion 
uh, to get objects back if they were illicitly sold or something like that or stolen. Yeah. Um, I also wanted to comment on this. Um, so um, during the Tibet, uh, during the military invasion of Tibet, a lot of artifacts were stolen. Um, actually, artifacts were stolen in 1904 by the British when they invaded Tibet. Um, then again, 1911, when the Qing invaded. And then again, in 1949 through 59 is when the Communist uh, Republic invaded and colonized Tibet. So over the course of 10 years, there's been a lot of looting. And a lot of these objects have somehow found homes and private um, ownerships uh, collections like the Rubens actually in New York. Um, and again, as Christian commented, it's hard to kind of figure out um, how to do repatri repatriation with a, with a lack of bureaucratic legal documents. Again, back in those days, legal procedures were not standardized. So now we have a standardized practice. So I also think it complicates how we think about repatriation, especially when we've developed um, standardized practices in the current moment that, you know, we, we can't go back in time and reproduce. So um, I think it's interesting in terms of how private collectors themselves want to engage repatriation you know, as a method for kind of giving back. Um, I also think Ruben's relationship with the Tibetan community is interesting because they've gone from um, an institution that Tibetan refugee community in, in New York villainized at first for actually housing a lot of these stolen artifacts during the invasion of Tibet. Um, and then I would say a decade later, now they're actually participating with the Tibetan refugee community in New York to do community um, kind of outreach and community kind of engagements. How do I feel about this? I think it's a better approach than previously not engaging with the Tibetans in New York. Um, mm -hmm primarily choosing to engage with Tibetans inside Tibet because authenticity was always an issue with, you know, anthropologists and museum anthropology. Um, but I think, um, I do think it's positive steps forward for trying to engage the community. Um, but I do think, again, there's a lot of power politics and positionality that needs to be considered because this is a beneficial relationship for Rubens also. So I, I do think that we shouldn't just um, excuse museums as spaces for just producing, you know, ethical ways of approaching new ways of doing engagement. But the fact that these museums need these artifacts to pretty much run its own identity. So um, I do think that that needs to be considered. Thank you, Dawa. As I got you here, could I also put another comment that is there uh, for you from Renata Peters? She says, thank you, Dawa. I much prefer the concept of weaponi weaponizing museum than self-colonization. Uh, would, would you mind commenting on that briefly? And then... Yeah. I was actually put off by the word self-colonization. Um, I'm not a museum anthropologist, so I have no idea what this is. Mm -hmm. So when I heard self-colonization, I just had a knee-jerk reaction, like, what does that even mean? Um, but I do like the concept of you know, weaponizing museums, because I do think at the end of the day, museums produce discourses and narratives. Mm -hmm. um, and I think what's really important is what is the museums for and who is the audience? Most of the time, it's not the native communities, it's outsiders. Um, museum has a long history with colonialism, just like anthropology does. So um, in, in, in terms of trying to change its identity in the current moment, I do applaud the discipline for trying um, but I do think a lot of attention needs to be paid to how specifically Native communities in North America and Pacific Islands, how they are using museums as a way to tell a story that centers them rather than the settler colonial state. So the development of indigenous sovereignty and nationhood and the history of colonization told through their perspectives. So again, I, I do think audience matters here. I think for a lot of indigenous communities, museums become a way for teaching their own community about their history, but also teaching outsiders about what happened to them. And, and the fact that, you know, what happened to them is not going to determine what happens to them in the present and in the future. So it is also about telling 
a story not only about the past, but again, my emphasis has been talking about the how does the past influence the present and how does that shape the way forward for a future? So if, if we're talking about agentive ways of moving forward, um, this, is, this is something that, that needs to be considered. So again, I'm not really sure about the word self-colonization, but again, I don't really know the background for this. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dawa. Uh, before we close, I will just uh, give another couple of minutes to Christian uh, to come in and comment for maybe a couple of minutes and Romina a couple of minutes. And then unfortunately we have to close uh, the session. So Christian, yes. Yeah, besides the weaponizing museum question, Renata also posed an earlier one about to whom or for whom these museums were made. Uh, and of course, uh, locally they are made for, in the end, I think for tourism, but they are also presented as for the local public and making these objects accessible to the local believers again. And so a very classic example is Hamis Monastery that says uh, in, in, in uh, local language, it's a Gutenkang to the locals. So it's a, a religious room, so to speak, that has the body support, but sells it as a museum to the Westerners. And so I think it's very clear that they engage uh, two different audiences uh, through the same institution here and that that is built in. You know, the, the, the concept of self-colonization is of course just a kind of way of me to think about it because I'm a bit puzzled by the whole phenomenon of them wanting to create these institutions that are essentially foreign to them and uh, in a context where they actually have the institution already uh, to achieve more or less the same thing. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. And Romina, a uh, final comment? I think I fully cover, but I, I mean, I was just to comment on, on what Christian Dawa said on, on self-colonization. I, when I heard it, I thought, again, um, sort of uh, replicating the model of a museum and the culture around a museum in, in a context that might not uh, had this culture of museums, you know, or, or might not think of culture in the same way. Because again, I think the museum in the way we've known it so far, there might be other ways, as, as Dawa says, you know, that we're not exposed to. Um, the culture is sort of at the center of, of what you perceive. Uh, it, so it's being objectified. There's that relationship. In my uh, travels and engagements with communities, uh, for many communities, culture and heritage is lived and it's lively and it's used. It has actual use in the daily life, right? So for instance, in Ethiopia, church, uh, or a monastery might be sort of a place to see if you're a tourist, you know, so might might have that kind of um, function as, as a sort of in the lines of a museum, I guess, but it's being used actively in the daily life and it has other meanings as well. So I think learning from the communities themselves, perhaps there is a way of um, teaching something about us, you know, us as in any community, um, through the monuments or, or buildings or artifacts that we, or um, tools that we use every day uh, through that active use, right? So it doesn't have to be, uh, I, I think Dawa used this, uh, this term, a stat made static or made an object in order for it to be appraised as, a, as, a, as something of cultural value or heritage. Um, so that's what I would, I would say, yeah. Learn from the communities. Yes, brilliant. Thank you so much, everyone. Uh, unfortunately, we have to close. Uh, you know, we could go on talking for another 